One. Junior Church, you are dismissed to walk. Bye, Addy. Bye, Molly. Okay. So, for the past few years, we've had some themes for each year that help us focus on what God is teaching and how God is leading us here at St. Joe Church of Christ. Last year, we looked at the theme of discipleship. And a disciple is one who not only accepts the teachings, but also spreads the teachings to other people. We went through the book of, of Romans to see how it describes being in a, a real disciple. This year we're focusing on what? Authentic. Good. Thank you. Some of you. We want to be an authentic. We want to be real, relevant in our faith. We don't want to put on a facade. We don't want to come across as fake. We want authentic faith. And so this year we've been looking and going through the book of Luke to see the authentic faith of Jesus. As we continue through Luke, we've been going through some very tough teachings of Jesus. Teachings about finances, teaching about being humble, teaching about doing all we can to make sure we get to heaven. And last week we saw the tough teaching about hell. Today we're in chapter 17, and this chapter is once again filled with some lessons that Jesus wants all of his followers to understand. We ask questions to to get understanding, and the same is true when it comes to our life of Christ. So what's one of the first questions that people ask when they come to Christ? Well, this is one I get asked a lot. What do I do now? How is life in Jesus different than the rest of the world? It's a very valid question to ask because there has to be a difference. If there is no difference in your life from coming to Christ, then there's no point in what you're doing. That's a new believer. A seasoned believer sometimes asks this, how can I live my life in a way that glorifies God continually? And I think the answer to both of these questions is found right here in chapter 17. Though it appears that these are a bunch of different or separate stories, I believe Luke is weaving for us a picture of discipleship, of how to grow and mature in a relationship with our risen Savior so that our faith remains authentic. So we're going to start and look through this chapter in verse 1 and 2. One day Jesus said to his disciples, there will always be temptation to sin. Notice that. There will always be temptation to sin. But what sorrow awaits a person who does the tempting? It would be better be thrown into the sea with a millstone hung around your neck than to cause one of these little ones to fall into sin. So watch yourself. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then if that person is repentant and forgive. But even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive. These are harsh, aren't they? Notice Jesus doesn't say it's wrong to be tempted. He says it's always going to be out there, that you're going to be tempted to sin. He tells us it's always going to be around, but he does not say it's wrong to be tempted. But notice what he does say, where he points at it. He talks about a person who purposely tempts someone else. This all comes to our behavior. Our behavior matters. Uh, You may have heard me say a few times that we can't make ourselves holy on our own. We can't do anything to make ourselves purely holy. If that is the truth, you believe that, that's called legalism. I've got to follow these rules, and that's what makes me holy. Instead, we are to model after God, to be free from sin and reflecting His character at all times. And sin is anything that keeps you from reflecting the character of God. And God recognizes that we're in a process, that we're still in the flesh, and there's a battle going on inside and around us. Temptations will come our way. And when they do, when they come, and they are a temptation to lead us away from what is in God's character, we need to battle them and resist them. There are two key things that Jesus brings up here that are key in this situation. First, make sure you are never the source 
of the temptation. Make sure you aren't tempting someone else to sin. The word cause here in the Greek is a word for causing hindrances that would fall, um, cause someone to fall into sin. Now how does that happen? Of course there's the obvious. That is a person you, you trust literally tempts you to sin. They purposely say, hey, why don't you lie? Hey, why don't you steal? Hey, they purposely do this. I've seen this happen even with Christian leaders who have tempted some of their people, their church, to do things that are of a sexually immoral nature. That they don't stand too close to those people. Especially during thunder and lightning because you just don't know if they're going to get struck. God takes a dim view of people who directly, purposely lead other people into sin. But it can also happen sort of indirectly. If you teach something that is contrary to God's word, but claim it is from God and somebody acts on that knowledge, it's the same thing, in my opinion, as leading someone into sin. If I know something and I want to teach it as this is gospel, but I, I don't really know if it's from scripture, but it's my opinion and you've got to do it. And, and then it starts leading you to do that. I have led you into sin. I have tempted you into that. It's a millstone. Notice Jesus says it's better for that person to have a millstone hung around their neck. It's a large stone piece of basalt that was placed on the ground. The upper millstone was placed on top. Donkey or ox would pull it around and grind that wheat. The small stone would weigh around 400 pounds. Can you imagine how fast that would pull you to the bottom of the sea? With one of those tied around your neck, you would have no hope of surviving into the depths of the water. So, but look at the second key Jesus brings up. So watch yourself. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. Then, if there's repentance, forgive. Even if that person wrongs you seven times a day and each time returns again and asks for forgiveness, you must forgive. We have to be on our guard. That's what it says. Watch out. Be on your guard. We have to watch out. Don't let anyone else cause you to sin. You cannot claim innocence here because Jesus tells you and I, watch out. Be on guard. Be alert for anything around you. Whether they're tempting you deliberately or indirectly, we have to watch out. Jesus is telling us to be on guard. For those who tempt without knowing it, if you are one of those who are, are tempting somebody without knowing it, there's still a word of caution. And that is for the person being tempted. If you see something that is a temptation, walk away. Be on guard and watch for it. My, my uh, middle brother, he, he loved money for a while. And, and so anytime there was money laying around, he took it. It could be two coins sitting out. Um, my parents had, my dad had this pig glass jar. It was the shape of a pig, and you'd open the top where the nose was. And that's where he kept all of his change. And it was just sitting there on his head, headboard. And he kept putting money in, but it was getting lower and lower the more he kept putting in it. Now, how does it do that? It was a magic pig coin jar. Well, Austin kept, or not Austin, Brady. Mm, my goodness, those are my boys. My brother, my brother kept taking some out so he could buy a pop or so buy some candy. He, he was taking that out. He was choosing to sin. And, and there was one time I saw it. And I thought, well, he's getting away with it. That's pretty cool. And so after he left and I was dusting, I took some money and went. My brother led me into sin. And I bought the candy and the pop. And then my dad found out. And I couldn't claim innocence. Well, Clint did it. So did you. See, we have to be on guard. Don't let that other person tempt you into sin. We are responsible for our own actions here. Flee. Get out of there. Put up boundaries. Set up roadblocks that will keep you from being tempted. 
Jesus also says, rebuke the person who chooses the sin. Rebuke. That's a weird churchy word. It means scold, reprimand, slap on the wrist, or punish. A person who chooses to sin needs to be told, you have done wrong. They need told this. They need that sin pointed out. They need to know that they are not just hurting God, but they are also hurting the church. They are hurting the rest of God's people. They are hindering people from going to heaven because of their actions, their attitudes, their words, or whatever it is. But as we've been learning in our Sunday school class that's going through Hosea, punishment is always meant for the purpose of repentance. You point out their sin not to shame them. You point out their sin not to judge them. You point out the sin to say, stop it. Turn and come back to God's way. It's not a judgment. It's helpful. If somebody was walking off of a cliff, wouldn't you tell them to stop? People who are walking in a direction of sin are walking off of a cliff towards hell, and it is our job to say, stop, turn, come back to God. But notice what also Jesus says. Jesus says, look for repentance. When we go to that person, we need to do it lovingly. Confront that person for the purpose of helping them get back into the fellowship. To be effective in their faith. Not to hold them down or push them down. Point out lovingly that the Word of God is clear about this. And that God wants us to be washed, transformed, and made new. If they blow you off, then God will just continue to work on them without you, maybe. But if they repent, it is up to you to offer forgiveness. If they repent, after you point it out, you are supposed to forgive them, even if that means their sin to you hurts. Galatians 6 says this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently, humbly help that person back on the right path. Be careful. It's the same phrase here. Watch out not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in the same way obey the law of Christ. No matter what, though, notice what Jesus says here. Watch out and be ready to forgive. If that person wrongs you even seven times a day. In another scripture, Jesus says, even if if he hurts you seven times 70. Now, how many of you like math? You, You can see it. I tell you. Uh, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Great, now i got to do math. I just want to have faith in Jesus. So don't do math, just forgive. It's easier. That's funny, people. I laughed really hard. I couldn't wait to share that with you. And I saw three people go, huh, thanks. Here is a very hard teaching for us. We want to hold on to unforgiveness. We want to hold a grudge. We want to make sure that person knows and is reminded of how much they've hurt us, how much they've sinned against us, how wrong they have done me. But notice what Jesus says. You must Forgive. It is not a suggestion. It is a command. It's not up for negotiation. You have to. If you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to forgive. Teachings go on. Jesus, uh, one of the apostles said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. That's kind of like that second question I asked. You know, the first one says, what's different? The uh, seasoned believer says, how do I live in a life that continually grows? How do I increase my faith? The Lord answers, if you have faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, may you be uprooted and planted the sea and it will obey you. I loved this scripture when I was in first grade. I can't tell you how many times I went up to trees and say, be uprooted, and it didn't work. I kept doing it. I just wanted, because I knew, I believed in him. And see, the the, the disciples were asked, how do I grow my faith? And and you can see little Donnie going, uprooted. It was like I was trying to be a Jedi, trying to use the force. 
But see, we need to grow our faith. How do we grow our faith? See, faith is being convinced of something based on evidence. It's not just a flight of, a flight of fancy. It's not something that, well, I'm just going to have faith in this. There is evidence for it. And because there is evidence for God in all of creation, because there is evidence of God working through all of history, because there is evidence of Him, I have faith that He can do even bigger and better things than I can imagine. I have a big imagination. I've always wanted to do big things. And so we need to drum up big confidence in an even bigger God. Not in what I can do but in only what He can do. See, when I was trying to uproot that tree, I was trying to do it. I can do this because I believe in Him. It's not that. It's I have belief that God will uproot that tree if it's going to hurt. If it's going to help somebody else, it's going to be gone, and I believe it. Not that I was physically using a Star Wars force to move a tree. It is trusting that God knows Big things and unimaginable things can happen. The key here is what uh, says in John 14. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. You will do the same thing Jesus has done and even greater works. Because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. He promises he will do everything in his name. Not in Donnie's name. Not in your name. But anything in his name. If you have a little bit of faith in the great big God, he will do it in his name. That is a huge piece of faith. In verse 6, Jesus tells them how to grow their faith. Live in His name. Live in Christ. Do everything in Him. Pray in Him. Worship in Him. Parent in Him. Live in Him. Marriage in Him. Drive, work, rest, eat, sleep. Everything in Jesus. A little bit of faith in Jesus has a huge impact. When we do God's work and glorify Him, He will do amazing things in and through us. Let's keep going on. Verse 7. When a servant comes in from plowing and taking care of the sheep, does his master say, come in and eat with me? No, he says, go prepare my meal, put on your apron, serve me while I eat, then you can eat later. And does the master thank the servant for doing what he was told to do? Of course not. In the same way, when you obey me, you should say, we are unworthy servants who have simply done our duty. That's offensive. This is a very offensive passage here. This guy was out working in the field all day. He is hungry, and here's the master just sitting at the table. I want my food. And he said, well, can I eat with you? No. Go, go cook my food. Put on your apron. You can eat later. And don't expect a thank you from the master. That's your job. Do it. So the servants can't eat with the master. Their hard work is not done. They do it not for approval or applause. They do it because it's expected. And although this sounds harsh, we need to understand the truth of it. We are God's servants. We should not be expected to be applauded and praised and have warm fuzzies poured on us. Or just to have physical blessings poured on us because we lived in faith. I don't need to feel good because I'm serving God. Feelings change and fade. I need to know that I obeyed God. There are blessings. Absolutely. Scripture says there are plenty of blessings that are going to come. But if you are doing it for the blessings, you're not doing it for God. You are now worshiping the blessing. We don't serve Him because of that. We serve Him because He deserves it. He is the Master. He is God. And I get called to be in His home to be a servant. That's a whole lot better than being outside of His presence. 
Let's go on verse 11. As Jesus continued on through Jeruz- uh, towards Jerusalem, He reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. He entered a village there. Ten men with leprosy stood at a distance. Notice their leprosy. They're not supposed to touch anybody. They're not supposed to be around anybody. So they're, they're doing what they're supposed to be. They're standing at a difference. They cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went, and as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Notice it wasn't until they obeyed that they were actually cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell on the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? That's very harsh. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. Wait a minute, I thought Jesus said, go and show yourself clean. He commanded them and they obeyed, right? So why was it that his faith healed him? I thought it was the word of God healed him. They could have just sat there and said, well, I'll wait till I'm clean, then I'll do it. Why did they obey him? Because they had faith. When he said it, it was done. See, Jesus didn't speak to them, touch them, or even heal them outright. They first called out to him. And then they obeyed, they responded to him, and that's when the healing came. But notice, only one of the ten did something as a result. The Samaritan, the one who was despised, who was a foreigner, who was not a part of the family of God. He's even hanging out with other Jewish lepers. This unclean man is doubly unclean because of leprosy, and he's hiding amongst the others. In sin, there's no distinction between us. There's no distinction between religious, social, or economic classes. Whether we've been a Christian for a long time or not. Whether we have lots of money or not. Whether we're male or female or not. Sin. Once we have sin, we are all associated with each other. We are sinners. It doesn't matter what I've done, what I look like, or what I can do. We're sinners. Remember earlier... Only one knew to give thanks. The servants are told to obey first. Just like in the former illustration Jesus said. Get in here. Go make my supper. Go do what you're told. These ten did what they were told. And then they, were re- they received healing. But only one came back to give thanks to him. Verse 20, let's go on. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, who will enter the kingdom of God? Um, When the kingdom of God will come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected. I'm trying to go fast, I'm sorry. When the kingdom of God, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there. For the kingdom of God is already among you. Then he said to his disciples, so he's talking to the Pharisees, then he turns and says to his disciples, the time is coming when you'll long to see the day when the Son of Man returns, but you won't see it. See, this, the Pharisees, they wanted a sign from this religious teacher guy, Jesus. Namely, they wanted a political takeover. They wanted to see if this Jesus was going to rise up, overthrow all the Romans, and start this new age, his new kingdom. Jesus says the kingdom will not come with someone that you can point out and say, well, this is the kingdom. That's right there. It's over here. It's happening there. The kingdom of God is anywhere that God is. Jesus, when He was on earth, His Spirit working in the lives of believers, it hasn't come in its fullness yet. But the kingdom of God is here. It is moving. It is living in amongst us. Right now, it's an underground kingdom, in a sense. It won't be that way forever. So His kingdom continues on earth in the lives of His followers. But there will be a physical return of Jesus when He banishes the rest of the darkness. When He reveals the fullness of His kingdom and He says, Here it is. And at that point, you are either the servant who has obeyed, or you're the one who is not even in the house. You are either in the kingdom of your not. 
And then he goes on, verse 23. People will tell you, look, there is the Son of Man. Or here he is, but don't go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and the lights and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it'll be on the day when the Son of Man comes. I got to see lightning last night. I, Casey and I love watching the lightning, the storm, and seeing the clouds and the flashes. And so many times people have said, there's Jesus, look. And, and then that instance has faded and passed. Well, here's the Messiah, and, and then it's gone. Just like that. No, that's not what Jesus, Jesus says. For it will be on the day when the Son of Man comes that the sky will rip apart with light and it will expose everything. Many times people are saying this is him, this is him, but it's not. There is no hidden return of Christ. There's a group of believers and they say that Jesus came to America and started a new church with them and then he went back up. It was this kind of hidden return. It wasn't his full return. So Jesus only did a half return is what I called it. He, he just made a pit stop. and then, No, when Jesus comes, it says every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. That means everybody will know. It won't be, do you think Jesus came? It won't be, I have to point out, look, there's Jesus. Everybody will know it. You won't have to be told because you will know it. There's no hidden return. And then Jesus goes on, but first the Son of Man must suffer terribly, be rejected by this generation. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets and parties and, and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. The world will be as the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating, drinking, buying, selling, farming, building, until the morning Lot left Sodom. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Yes, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a person out on the deck of the roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return home. Remember what happened to Lot's wife. The mission of Jesus is to suffer first, he said. Rule second. He's going to suffer first because of his love and his grace for us. But in the meantime, before his return, people are going to live life like normal. People have no sense of the danger they're in. They don't sense the danger when Noah told them the destruction was coming. They, they mocked and laughed at him. In Genesis 6-7, through 7, you can read what happened to them. In Genesis chapter 18-19, and 19, and you can read about the destruction that came to the two towns of Sodom and Gomorrah. And how the people just didn't believe any of that. But that's, that's old times, right? When, when a hurricane came to Louisiana, everybody fled because they knew it was going to hurt, right? And, and they all got out for safety. And that's why Hurricane Katrina, there was never a casualty. People obeyed when they were... Oh, wait, they didn't, did they? There's this huge hurricane coming right now to Florida. And you know what they showed people on the news doing? Boarding up their houses, storing up water, and we're going to ride through it. And some are going to survive just fine. But when warnings come, what do people do? Ah, it's not that bad. No, nah, I can handle it. And Jesus says, no. When the day comes, when he returns, you won't withstand it. Verse 33, if you cling to your life, you will lose it. And if you let your life go, you will save it. That night, two people will be asleep in one bed. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour together at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Where will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked. Jesus replied, just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, these signs indicate the end is near. And this is gross. Oh, look, there's some carrion birds out there. Vultures. Let's go see the carcass. That's what Jesus is saying here. See, people might look the same on the outside, but all that matters is in their heart if they know Jesus, if they know him. One sign of the end, a vulture is not enough. I, I've watched enough documentaries and animal shows to see that when there is a struggling beast about to die, a vulture will come and watch. It's a sign that the end's coming. And then it straggles on and that vulture hops around and just keeps waiting. 
And then a second one comes, but no, that animal's still walking along. It's not until all of them are there that they can finally feast because the deed is done. The animal is finally passed. We may see evidence as little signs now and then, one or two vultures here and there. That's just telling you and I and the rest of the world, it is coming. Be ready. So how do we wrap all this up, this chapter, this weird chapter? Remember I said this is about being an authentic disciple here. Let's back up and look at our picture of a maturing disciple. An authentic disciple of Christ will encourage spiritual growth, not sin. They will extend forgiveness. They will have simple trust in God. The heart of a certain. They will extend the kingdom invitation to anybody who wants to have faith. They will live in expectation that Jesus is returning. Now if you look in your bulletins, you'll see there's quite a few spaces left. You all know that I can get kind of long-winded. Just hold on with me for a little bit longer though. Because we're going to boil this down to see what this chapter really says about an authentic disciple. And how an authentic disciple, a real disciple, will act. First, an authentic disciple will act wisely. Verses 1 and 2. One of the things Casey loves to tell the boys. Brady, make wise choices. That's something she's been telling them because we know boys don't make wise choices. Left on their own. And guess what, girls? You're no different. So she is constantly trying to remind them. Make wise choices. It's a personal choice. You have to act on this. Verses 1 and 2 talk about avoid sin and help others to avoid sin. So make wise. Act wisely. Authentic disciple will love openly. They will offer forgiveness and let go of grudges. Which can only happen when we love people. There are times that people have disappointed and hurt you and made you angry. And you know what you need to do? You did this wrong. You did this wrong. But I love you. Now let's fix it. Let's get back to, let's get back to working the right way. Authentic disciple will trust faithfully. Mustard seed faith here, okay? Trust God faithfully with anything and everything you've got. An authentic disciple will serve humbly. It's not your job to get the praise and accolades. It's your job to serve. Remember, serve God, not ourselves, not for thanks, not for glory. You serve God. Authentic disciple will worship publicly. This is one that a lot of people, I think, have a problem with. See, that leper, the ten went. They, they went home. They hadn't been home. They wanted to see their family. They were restored. They were finally healthy again. And one came back to praise in front of everybody. And he was a Samaritan in the middle of all these Jews. This unclean man was still unclean because he was not a Jew. And he came back to thank God. And you and I need to realize we were unclean because of our sins and publicly we need to praise him well I can praise him out in the woods or when I'm fishing or on the golf course that is that's wrong you can but you don't you need to praise him publicly who cares what they think this leper when he came back he didn't care what anybody else thought he wanted to thank the God who saved him. And you and I need to thank and praise him. An authentic disciple will live expectantly. We are on this world for a short time. We need to live in a way that we are expecting Jesus to come back at any moment. Meaning we, we are ready to go with him. I, I was... Let me get a little real. I, I wasn't the best teenager. I broke curfew a lot until my car was taken because I deserved it. But I broke curfew. I was making unwise choices. And my youth minister told me at the time because my parents were like, oh, trying to figure out how to deal with this teenage boy here. 
And so Keevan, my youth minister, came and he goes, so when you're breaking the rules, are you ready to meet Jesus? When you are acting out right then, when you purposely know, because you know when you're supposed to be home and you choose not to be home, are you living in a way that you're ready to say, there's Jesus and I'm ready to go? Are you and I living expectantly, no matter what we're doing, that when he comes, we can say, I'm ready? Because that goes back to make wise choices. We need to live expectantly. We need to encourage spiritual growth, not sin. Extend forgiveness. Have simple trust and the heart of a serpent. And then extend that kingdom to anybody who wants to have faith in Jesus. If we're doing those things right there, we are living an authentic life as a disciple. You don't do these to get into heaven, but because you are getting into heaven, you do these things. And so here's the thing. You want to know how to live your life as a believer and keep glorifying and growing in faith? Do these things. That's what Jesus said in this chapter. It's not what I said. He said it. Do these things. Commanded. And then when he comes, he'll wrap you up and take you home. My, my grandmother, I told you, my grandma Blake, she passed away. And I know she lived, she wasn't perfect. I know she wasn't perfect. But she did a lot of those things. And at her funeral, we sang one of the songs we sang this morning, I'll Fly Away. We sang it at a funeral. Because she wanted people to know she went home. That when she died, God took her home. She was living expectantly. And they lived in eternity now with her. We can do that now. To prepare for that day. Are you living in a way that says, I'm ready, God. But until you come, I'm doing it here. So that others can follow. What's your choice? If you need to make a decision today, won't you come? We're going to stand. We're going to sing a song. And if you need to make a decision, won't you come today?